And we're happy that we are here, your church, so we can sing songs for the Lord. Our first song is This Love That Make us Makes Us Happy. Thank you, Rina. The number is 579. 579. Oh, no, 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 no. Stand up, stand up, stand up. You can stand up, stand up. Thank you. Because he lives. Five, two, six. Five, two, six. Hi. Thank you. 
Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for gathering us here on the Sabbath day, and uh, we just praise you for being with us uh, throughout this week. I know for myself it's been a little bit exhausting, and so we just pray that we can confidently say these words, it is well with my soul, because you truly are here abiding with us right now, and I pray that you be with the Lim family as they lead this Vespers. I pray that your Holy Spirit and your presence will just I'm reading it through here, and I pray that you help us um, learn the things that you want us to learn and apply it in our lives. This I ask in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath to everyone, and uh, it's nice to be back, all right, and uh, I don't know when was the last time I was here and my family, but yes, 
it is always pleasant that God's people come together and unite in songs, prayers, and in seeking God's word. Tonight is, uh, tonight's Best Verse is uh, sponsored by Inspire Ministries, and uh, we are featuring uh, the Lim family. Uh, they will introduce themselves later on, and we will hear a special song after I speak. And then after that, um, Brother uh, Davis Lim will share a testimony um, I'm, I'm not sure what exactly he will be talking about, but uh, when I heard him share what he has experienced, he has so many experiences, um, it was really encouraging and inspiring. And so tonight, we will be experiencing that uh, inspiration and excitement. Um, before I go into that, uh, before we have the special music, I just like to read something here from the book, Our High Calling, in page 148. And it reads, God desires us to be cheerful. He desires us to be filled with praises to his name. He desires us to carry light in our countenances and joy in our hearts. We have a hope that is far above pleasures that the world can give and this fact should be made manifest why should not our joy be full full not luck no, lacking nothing have uh, we have an assurance that jesus is our savior and that we may draw freely from him we may partake freely of the rich provision that he has made for us in his word he may take him, we may take him at his word, believe on him, and know that he will give us grace and power to do just as he bids us. We may constantly seek the joy of his presence. We need not be all the time um, upon our knees in prayer, but we may be constantly asking for his grace, even when we are walking on the streets, or when we are engaged in our ordinary daily duties. We may constantly keep in mind ascend, uh, the mind ascending to Christ, and He will freely impart to us of His grace. So we want to share the, the things that God has done in our lives. And we need to practice this more often. And so I would like to uh, entitle this presentation as Sharing the Story of Jesus Through Our Experiences. At this time, we'd like to call the Lim family for a special music, after which Brother Davis will come up and share his testimony. Yeah. Good evening and happy Sabbath. We are so happy to be with you and share the Sabbath blessings together with you. And um, like we always want our kids to be Hello? more prayerful, oh. more more closer to God. And sometimes it's just hard to memorize the scriptures, yeah. like just word by word. And we were thinking, let's make a melody. And just last week we made one melody for Psalms 91, 2. So we will sing it two times. Okay. I will sing of the Lord, He's my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. I will sing of the Lord, He's my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him will I trust. Sometimes, you know, melody just sticks to your mind and wherever you go, it just comes up to your mind and just keep singing and it's just so encouraging. When we have trials and tribulations, we just keep singing and rejoicing in the Lord. 
And I just wanted to share the, more about um, my, my girl, especially this little one. She's a prayer warrior in our family. He she, says, when we start to eat, she prays for her Dio brother, Tio. Wow. Yeah, she prays. Tio can Dio walk to the farm wow. two times. She says the sentence and then she says, Amen. And then sometimes she says, Tio can get better. Amen. And one yeah. time, mm-hmm. we were in a playroom at Toronto McDonald's where we stay. And I was just on a recliner, just reading something, and then I see she just goes on her knees, just like suddenly, and then she puts her hand together and she prays, Tio can go up to the farm, amen. <laughs> and just she stands up. I was so impressed, like, like, and then she was like, when we pray all together as a family, she prays first, and then she organizes who is praying yeah. next. Like, Jen Lee prays, Yona pray. pray, Mama pray. Everyone has to pray. <laughs> Nobody cannot um, skip. And if somebody is quiet, she keeps repeating, um, Jen Lee, Jen Lee pray. <laughs> so it's just so heartwarming when, you know, kids are having their own initiative sometimes to just even um, pray and to um, talk with God. Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Amen. You know, the Sabbath day is is such a blessing. Uh, I came into this church when I was 10 years old, before we were evangelical Christians. And uh, when my parents started to come to the evangelistic meetings of Daniel and Revelation, we're like, wow, we've never heard this message ever before. And uh, after the meetings, uh, the pastor came and studied with my mother and father. I was 10 years old at that time, and I would listen, I'd sit, I'd join the Bible studies, and after two months of Bible study, I was like, wow, this, this all makes sense, you know, the Sabbath, clean and unclean, the spirit of prophecy, the remnant church, the mission of the church, and we said, yeah, we'd like to join the church. So that was back in 1996, June 6. So that was quite a while ago. And um, the Sabbath is, it's a blessing because, you know, when you think about what God asks us to worship, does he ask us to worship the sun or the coconut trees? He says there's a time period, and this time period is sacred. And if you remember the Sabbath and you worship him and keep the Sabbath holy, then it is a sign, it's a seal. So uh, Isaiah 58, verse 13 and 14, do we know that? It's very famous for for the Sabbath. It's a promise. Yes. Uh, It says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thy own ways, nor finding thy own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride up upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And it's a challenge, you know. We live in a time and an age where, you know, we have a cell phone, we have messages that pop up. So can I challenge us to just... Is it possible to put our phones on silent or airplane mode if you're very important? It's a very important messages because, you know, when you think about the Sabbath, it's a time where there's a lot of distractions. But uh, this is a time if we delight ourselves in, in God and instead of doing our own pleasures, we, we call the Sabbath of delight. God will bless and honor us. So today... You know, one hour ago, I actually didn't want to come here. And uh, my tooth was aching and in pain. And uh, I was just thinking, I hate toothaches. They're terrible. I remember I had a toothache, and the nerve rotted out. And it was like three days of terrible pain. Has anyone ever had that experience? Yeah, you had? Well, what are some natural remedies? Like, what's the best solution? Is it Tylenol, Advil? Is there any herbs you can put on? Salt gargle, yeah. 
Go to the dentist, yeah. Well, we went to the dentist actually, and I asked the dentist to pull out the tooth. They did the x-ray, and then they found out, oh, it's very deep, and you might need a root canal, but uh, let's try to fill it, let's try to save it. I said, I don't want it, get rid of it. And they're like, no, no, let's try to do it. And um, now I'm in pain, and I guess I have to go back on Monday or Tuesday, and then get them to pull it out. But, um, you know, it's a blessing to come back here because, you know, on summertime, we had VBS here. And even I remember when Rena was pregnant with Ziona, she's six right now. We were actually, she actually started to have labor. And we were living in that Surrey at that time. And uh, we went to the hospital and they checked her and they're like, oh, you're not dilated far enough. So you should just go and come back later. So we said, oh, let's go to church. So we came here to church. And during uh, the, now they ask him, who are the visitors? What are you doing here? And we're like, oh, we're here because, yeah, we, we, we can't, my wife can't give birth right now. So we're, we're just going to worship here together until the contractions are at the right time, you know, harder and, and, and more, more close together. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's just been a blessing to, to be over here because, you know, the, the history behind this place. And so, uh, before I share uh, a bit of the testimony, let, let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father in heaven, I thank you that we're here together on the Sabbath day. It's easy to be at home, turn on the television, or, or put something on the internet, but we are here gathered together because we seek fellowship. We seek communion with you and with each other. And I just pray, Lord, as um, we share, as I share my testimony, that uh, others may be inspired and that we may gain wisdom and knowledge, especially in these days where we're living so close to your soon second coming. May you bless us as we meditate upon your word and upon spiritual things. If there's any distractions, we just pray you may help us to have self-control, help us to be disciplined, help us to delight in the Sabbath instead of doing our own way because we know only true joy can come from you. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so where do I start? Well, you know, we've been here in Vancouver for the last uh, nine months. Uh, some of you know us. We, my wife and I, we used to be missionaries. I met her, she was a medical missionary in Malaysia, actually, at that time. And I was a literature evangelist, and I was actually working in Brunei. And um, it's interesting, because when I first canvassed Brunei, it was really nice that I was able to meet a lady, and she was an Adventist, but she was a PR. And then later on, I went there again, and this lady introduced me to her friend's daughter, who was um, brought up in the Adventist church. And uh, she this, this friend's lady um, daughter bought a bunch of books from me, and she said, would you like to work for me? I was like, oh, you just met me today, and you want me to work for you and your company? And I said, I'll, let me pray about it. So I went off to Sabah, to Malaysia, and, and Philippines, and I really prayed about it. And uh, I looked at the statistics because Brunei is one of the only countries where um, there's only, there's actually zero citizens that are Seventh-day Adventists. And during that time, you know, my heart was very mission-minded because, you know, the Bible says, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then the end shall come. So, you know, there's some countries like, how, how can Christ come if the gospel is not preached? And... Like um, in Brunei, you have this, this really rich country, but not one citizen is a Seventh-day Adventist. And so I prayed about it, and I asked God for, for like a vision, because I was reading about Paul, and how Paul, when he went to Macedonia, the angel talked to him and said, stay here. And so I prayed about it, but I didn't get any vision, unfortunately. But, um, you know, God, God really opened up the way, because in Brunei, you know, there was, um, it's just such an amazing country. It's right by Philippines. It actually used to be like the Sultan actually uh, before they owned part of Philippines for a while too, the history behind that. But um, 
Anyway, I worked there for two years selling textbooks to universities. And I remember Rina, I met her at a Bible study group in Malaysia. And I asked her to come. Uh, she was going to actually come to Brunei. So I said, oh, here's my contact. Give me a call when you come. I can arrange your housing and accommodations. So when she came to visit me, I actually was um, asked to speak at the Ministry of Education. And so these are like the people who organize the curriculum for all of Brunei. And since they saw my command of English was much better than their people, they said, oh, can you talk about a motivational or inspirational message? And I talked about the longest living people in the world, about the, the blue zones. And, and uh, I, 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 at the end of the message, you know, I said, oh, this is my friend. She's a medical missionary. She's using herbs and natural remedies. And I asked her to come forward. And then she shared her, her testimony with uh, these people. And uh, later on, the chairman, he came forward. And he's like, you know, we shouldn't be serving fried chicken and, and uh, fried you know, fries and things like that. Next time, we'll have cucumbers and carrots <laughs> for our snacks. I was like, oh, wow, praise the Lord, you know, some, some changes. But anyway, uh, later on, my, my mom came to visit my uh, Rina and I, and she put the seed in our mind. She said, you know, you both are single. You both should, you know, come, uh, you know, take care of one another. And, and anyway, at first, I didn't really think uh, Rina as someone I would be interested to marry, but the more I traveled with her, I saw she had a really good heart. She wasn't really bossy. She didn't get agitated easily. And we could get along very easily. Because of my previous girlfriend in Malaysia, when we traveled, oh, she was so controlling and just miserable when I traveled with her. But Rina is, yeah, she, she is such a nice lady. And um, some of my weaknesses was I would eat out a lot. I would sleep late at night. But Rina, she was really strict with the diet. She'd always cook her own food. Yeah, and she sleeps early all the time. She doesn't want people to disturb the rest. So I'm like, this girl will help me in my spiritual walk, you know. And, and um, so, yeah, af after we were in Brunei later on, she worked with me for a year, and then we got married. But one week before getting married, I actually got blacklisted from Brunei. So I was kicked out of Brunei. And, um, but I still went in because I had two passports. So I used my other passport. But later on, I got in trouble. And because of that trouble, I was put into prison. Yeah, in, in Brunei. So I was sentenced to one year in prison. And at first, the first judge was saying, oh, what you did, okay, uh, I'll give you a fine. So they fined me $800 and then after I paid it, they weren't happy with that fine. So they brought me to the Supreme Court. And then after that, the, 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 the judge was like, you know, return the money. You're going to jail for one year. So at that time, Jen Lee was only six months old at that time when I went to jail. And uh, at first, I was so stressed out. I'm like, I got to get out of here. And you know, at the very beginning, uh, from the first court case to the second, I was actually able to um, I was able to ask the immigration officers to bring me to visit my uncle. So they let me visit my uncle. And when I got to my uncle's place, I was in the car and I jumped out of the back into the back seat and I ran and I ran to the Canadian high calm. And I asked them, and when I got there, I was so tired. And I asked them, you got to help me. The Brunei has, has taken me hostage. And um, this is sovereign ground, you know, you, don't, you can't let me take him away because, you know, there's um, Julian Assange and he went to an embassy and it's like a sovereign ground. But the embassy didn't protect me. And so all they could do was they said, you know, if you have um, money or relatives, they can help with bringing money in to hire a lawyer. So at the very end, yeah, they didn't really do much. But anyway, the first few days, they were just so stressful. Uh, in prison, I thought, Lord, help me to be like Samson, to break these walls, you know, to, to or help me to be like Philip, to trans, to, to teleport, you know, how Philip teleported um, away from the Ethiopian man, right? And, uh, but you know, God didn't answer my prayer, and I was stuck in prison. And uh, eight months, it passed pretty fast. And uh, I remember my wife, she brought me the Adventist hymnal, 
And I was able to actually memorize over a hundred hymns. And uh, she brought me uh, Conflict of the Ages series, and she brought me also Testimonies to the Church, volume one to nine. How many of you have read Testimonies to the Church, one to nine? You, you read through it, all of it? Oh, Sama, you should go to jail, and then you can finish it. <laughs> In Brunei, yeah, yeah, you could go over there. It's better than North Korea, because yeah, if you do something there, they'll put you into like a labor camp for 10 years. It's pretty bad. But yeah, I remember reading testimonies to the church. I'm just going through, and I remember like three months passed. I'm like, man, I still got so much more to read. And it took me a long time to go through that whole book. But uh, just reading all these letters that Ellen White wrote to, um, to people who are in charge of schools, of sanitariums, of missionary work, and also about people's character, you know. It, it, um, it's just amazing, the things that she wrote. And um, yeah, I, I, I look back and I actually thank God because, you know, I think I learned more in prison in those eight months than I ever did in maybe, I never went to theology school, but you know, I, I learned a lot of things and it was such a blessing. And um, after coming back from Brunei, we settled here and um, we prayed a lot and God, and my father said, you know, why don't you stay with me? So my father actually bought 40 acres up in Salmon Arm. And uh, at first he was actually gonna rebuild a house in Surrey, a big house that we said, you know, dad, you should just sell it. And then let's, we should just get a big place up in the countryside. So now um, my dad listened to the advice of my brother and I, and he bought um, 40 acres and we're doing country living. So we live off grid. We don't have electricity coming in. We had to um, dig using excavator to make our own well. And um, yeah, my wife and I, we built our own cabin just last year. And it's, it's, been, it's been different. My, my children, they really enjoy it because if you read Country Living, do you know what are the benefits of living in the countryside? What are the benefits? Fresh air. Serenity. Serenity. Quiet. More books over there. Yeah, yeah. Well, two of the things that really hit me when reading Country Living was like, the city is full of like congestion. Like it's a place that's not sustainable. And it talks about how if parents want to raise good kids, the character of kids growing up in the country and nature is so much better than in the city where there's so much corrupting influences. And another thing is, she says like in the last days when all the famines and destruction and, and all the chaos falls upon the earth, if you have your own piece of land with your own garden, you're better off than a king or a queen. So it's not about how much money you have, it's not about, but if you have your own self-supporting sustenance. So those were the things that really caught me and I see with my children, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a blessing because uh, seeing them working with um, my father and he has a whole bunch of goats and chickens and ducks, it's, uh, it's just, it's, yeah, growing up like that's so different. Because I grew up in Wally, and if you know Wally, I just, it's where the drug addicts are, the prostitutes, and there's a lot of gangs. So I, I, I want to protect my children away from those influences. So anyway, after, after our experience, yeah, li country living, you know, we want to go as natural as possible because with uh, Rina as a natural path. So our last daughter, Ziona, no, Azura, she's two years old now. Uh, we decided to have her as a home birth. So she was born in a bathtub and everything was natural. Everything was so smooth. But um, the last child we have, Theo, he was born April 14th. And uh, there were some signs that some things were going wrong because my wife's stomach, when the midwife did the measurements, they said, whoa, it's growing really fast. Like it's the measurements are too big. They're, they shouldn't be this big. So we said, you know, if we do an ultrasound to just calm your fears, is that okay if we just do a simple ultrasound just to check the cerebral, the, the fluid, if there's too much. And so 
we went for the test, I think it was on the 12th, and then Rina went into labor. And so during the scan, they found out the flu was too much, and when Theo was born, they found out his esophagus wasn't connected to his stomach. It actually came up and made a connection to the trachea, and then when he swallowed, it just went to a pouch. So that's why every time he swallows, it just goes back into the fluid. So that's why the stomach became so big, my wife's stomach, because the fluid couldn't be swallowed. So right when he was born on the 14th at 3 a.m., uh, right in the morning, there was an airplane that came and then took Rina and Theo to Children's Hospital. So we've been uh, here at the hospital ever since. Yeah, so it's been nine plus, nine plus months. And it, it's been such a journey because, you know, when they first come in, um, we didn't get the hepatitis vaccine and we didn't get the antibiotics and the vitamin K injection, we didn't get either. And what's really interesting is do you know what happens on the eighth day to a child, to a baby? A boy, yeah, circumcision. For a boy, yes, yes. But something else also happens. There, there's a hormone. The vitamin K actually spikes right on the eighth day. And that's when surgeries should be done. So I actually asked the doctors, is it possible to delay it? But they said, because he's on a breathing mass, air is getting pumped in the stomach, we gotta do it right away. So they wanted to do the surgery on the Sabbath, but we said, you know, we're, we're not really comfortable with that. And is it okay we do it the next day? So they did it on Easter Sunday, the surgery, to, to um, disconnect that fusion and then reconnect the stomach. So after that, you know, he was doing really well. He was able to drink milk, to, to latch on to um, my wife's paps, and he was able to drink breast milk and breathe on his own. But then a month later, he got COVID. So he started to breathe really heavy and he was on a machine. And yeah, ever since then, once he got COVID, they did a CT, uh, CT scan and then a bronchoscopy. And he has, bron he has um, trachomalacia. So with the trachomalacia, they said, oh, they can actually after the CT, they found out a blood vessel comes up from the heart, the aorta, and it's pushing against the trachea. And because of that, that's why the trachea can't get the air properly. So the doctor said that, the surgeon said he could actually do an aorta plexi by pulling the aorta up more so that it, it prevents constriction. And he'd also cut out the thalamus gland because the thalamus is right at the sternum, right? But we said, please leave it alone or cut it in half, you know, if you really need to cut it out. So he only cut it in half and, and took out half. But um, after the surgery, he actually had to do it three times because the first time he became all swollen, my son, and then they couldn't close him up. So they did something else, but it didn't work so well. And then the third time he just um, maneuvered it a little bit. So it helped out 50%. So anyway, after that, they closed him up but then a week later, infection, just pus everywhere. And uh, he was on antibiotics for six weeks. And then right after the antibiotics, he got another infection, he got sick again. And he got a lung infection and then another blood infection too. And it, it's challenging because you know, they have all these antibiotics. I see them taking blood and He's crying and they try to get an IV and all his blood vessels are all, they can't find any anymore because they're all taken. And even when he had his pick line in his arm, he, he developed a blood clot and the blood clot went all the way to the heart actually. So it's, it's just so hard to see, you know, especially with all these drugs that he's on. So I started to do research on some of the drugs that he's on and one of them is midazolam. And midazolam is a sedative that they put, that they give him. And I found out that midazolam actually causes a lot of problems in seniors because Toronto did a study and it was published. And these seniors, a lot of them actually develop respiratory problems. They develop pneumonia, they had a lot of phlegm, and like 48% had to go to the ER because of taking this drug. Yes. 
And so like, why are they giving my son this drug that can cause the lung issues? So I asked the doctors, is it okay if we wean this drug off of him? And the doctor said, okay, we can do that. So they weaned him off at 50 micrograms per day because it's supposed to be 50 micrograms per week. And they warned us he might get seizures if you cut cold turkey or if you do it too fast. So anyway, he was weaned from 600 to 650, uh, uh, 550 down to 100, and then they stopped. And three days later, he gets seizures, 12 seizures from midnight all the way till 10 a.m. And um, during that night, they couldn't get a hold of us. But once they finally did, they said, we started on meningitis medications. I was like, no, no, it's not meningitis. It's because of the dependency on uh, the lorazepam. So I said, please stop it. And the doctor was saying, sorry, you know, this is, if it's seizures, it's, it's life or death. If he has it, you know, this will, will help treat the meningitis. And I said, I don't give you any permission to continue the antibiotics. You got to stop them. And so anyway, the next day, we, we got a call from Ministry of Child and Family Development because they think I'm a negligent father for not giving the antibiotics for the, for the meningitis. But the thing is, if a child doesn't have a rash, if it doesn't have a fever, the chances of getting meningitis are actually extremely rare, extremely rare. So anyway, um, at the end, he didn't have meningitis. So they just, yeah, praise the Lord that he didn't have meningitis. So anyway, we're learning a lot of things because this is quite a journey, you know, learning about these drugs. So I shared my test, uh, my story a little bit with some church members in White Rock Church. And in White Rock Church, a lady was like, huh, lorazepam, that's the drug that Jordan Peterson was addicted to. So do, does everyone know Jordan Peterson? Yeah, he's quite famous. He's a clinical psychologist. And a few years back, he was actually taking lorazepam for anxiety and to help him sleep. But he became a dependent on them. And he didn't want to be dependent on them, so he went to Russia, and he actually went to a program where they induced him into a coma so they can flush his body out of the, flush the, the drug out of his system. And he almost died. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite an interesting thing. And there's even a documentary called Take Your Pills, Xanax. It's a documentary on Netflix, and it's done by Arnold Schwarzenegger's ex-wife and the daughter. And uh, it's, it's really interesting because, you know, this Xanax, Ativan, it's, um, it's actually, you know, it makes you really relax. Because if you ever have anxiety or depression, the doctors will, will say, oh, take, take this Ativan. It's... And so it works at first. You're really relaxed, but you become really dependent on it. And then once it starts to wean, you actually become suicidal and you become even more agitated. And that's why there's a lot of people who commit suicide after they, they get on this drug. So, you know, all of this we didn't know before, but because of our son, we're learning all of these um, side effects of these drugs. So we're still praying because our son still has quite a lot of issues. He has um, his heart, he has a double outlet left ventricle. Usually there's um, outlets on left and right ventricle, but his are both on the left side. So it's always mixing oxygenated and deoxygenated blood all around. And um, yeah, it's, it's just hard to imagine, you know, because we're all fearfully and wonderfully made, you know, God, the way he designed things. But um, sometimes I ask God, why, why is my son like this? You know, is it because of pesticides from apples or grapes? You know, is it from GMO food? Is it... What can it be, you know, that causes all these things? Is it even, because my wife, she actually got COVID during her pregnancy too. And we also met another lady and um, she also had COVID and her son also had a mutation in um, his toe. But um, we, we don't know, you know, all these trials, all these tribulations, I think they're, they're to test us, you know. And for us, like we've met so many families and there's one Chinese family we met. They actually live in Kamloops. They have an eight-year-old and a 10-year-old boy. And um, they, they went hiking. 
But at nighttime, they came back home. At two o'clock in the morning, the younger son gave out a shout. The mother came and he stopped breathing. They called the ambulance and the ambulance shocked him and he was able to re, uh, come alive again. But it was a bit too late because it damaged his brain so much. And now the son, Joshua, he's a vegetable. He can't go to the toilet, he can't walk, his vision, he only can see shadows, he's drooling all the time, and um, he has a G-tube, and yeah, they, they, they don't know what happened. The whole family isn't Christian, they're just free thinkers that are from China, and so we've, we've told them about the story of Jesus. We told them that God can work miracles, and there is hope, and uh, they're, they're very happy. They, they actually said, you know, it was actually interesting just to meet you guys. You guys are very encouraging, you know, to share with us that, that there is a God. And because for them, they were working, they were going to retire in a few years and go back to China. But now everything is just in confusion for them. So it, it's hard to imagine because Jen Lee is also eight years old. Like, can you imagine if a child, boom, it just becomes like handicapped like that. So it's, it's quite an interesting place where we're at. We were really blessed because at first, when we first came here, we had housing for one month. And then later on, the housing fund was gone. So we actually stayed inside our van and we bought a little trailer. So we sleep in the parking lot and then we come into the hospital to do our laundry and to eat. And uh, there was some complaints. So we actually found a little room from the Oak Ridge Church. They actually had a suite available. So we stayed there for one month. But then we got a call from Ronald McDonald House because they just dropped the mandates for the max vaccination. So we just moved to Ronald McDonald House November 1st. And it's, it's, uh, it's different, it's, especially for my children. There's so many other kids. There's girls with children with leukemia and cancers and all types of diseases. So, you know, it's, it's a blessing. We can minister to them and pray with them. And uh, even to meet other families that are Christian and uh, to pray together, it's, it's a blessing. So, yeah, we're, we're all here for a purpose. We're all here on a journey. I know that trials come, you know, you get a toothache in life or you have a son that is born with all these, you know, mutations and issues. It's like, why? Why, Lord? But... Um, you know, there's a Bible verse I want to share with you. It's found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. And it says that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So yeah, I, I think with all these things that are happening to us, it's, it's like a purging. And God is trying to purify and to purge us. Because can you imagine if the Israelites, they're going through the desert and everything is comfortable for them? They wouldn't rely on God, right? And same with life, you know, like man sinned and there's no thorns, there's no thistles, there's no death. We wouldn't realize what sin is, right? But... Um, yeah, it's because of these things we, we have pain, we have suffering, and then they, they draw us on to our knees. We, we, we are asking God why, and, and he's the one that will comfort us, and he's the one that gives us the answers. And um, it's, it's hard sometimes because, you know, just that nerve being exposed, you know, or too much heat or too much coldness, you know, like we humans become uncomfortable so easy, right? And uh, we live in a time and age right now, 2023, things are happening in this world. You can see that, uh, you know, Bill Gates and Elon Musk and the World uh, Economic Forum, there's a lot of things going on in this world, you know. The, the amount of taxes, our food, the cost of living in Vancouver, you know, you can see the world is, is changing, right? And uh, we as Adventists, God has blessed us with the message, the last message to share to the world that God is love, that God, what is the gospel? It's Christ in us, the hope of glory, right? And um, 
as we share our resources, as we share what God has blessed us with, that's what really sort of um, gives purpose to our life and, and brings joy. Because at the end of the day, you know, you can earn a lot of money. You can have, you know, lots of things saved up for that time of trouble. But, you know, at the very end, if, if you are not, I guess if you, if you don't have a purpose in life, if you're not really living for others, because the greatest joy is actually when you live for others. When you, like if you listen to the um, story of Dwight Moody and how he helped all these street children and, and uh, during one Thanksgiving dinner, you know, all of a sudden the kids started to break out and, and Dwight asked, oh, well, what, what's all that commotion? What's going on? And all the children said, you know, we are so thankful for you, Dwight Moody. You know, because of what he's done. He, Dwight Moody just told them the gospel, that there's a Savior, that the Savior loves them. He buys shoes, over 20 pairs of shoes, and he would just give them to the street children. He would ask the mayor for the big hall so that he could bring the street children and, and teach them about Christ every Sunday. And um, yeah, he would even buy coal and get the coal delivered to poor homes that would need heat in the winter time. So, you know, it's stories like that, even like of um, Schindler's List, right? There was a time where, you know, at the very end of the movie, he saw his gold ring, he saw his car, he's like, all of this, this could have been one more soul, another fan, I could have saved another person. And so, you know, in, in this life that we live in, all these trials we have, I think they're to wake us up, you know? Because I was just watching, um, I was just on Facebook, my friend posted a, a bunch of pictures of all these different countries and what food they eat and how much money they spend a week. And they have America, they have Canada, and they have like really poor countries too. And like in Africa, sometimes all they eat is just some simple beans, some grains, and they only spend like $20 a whole week for that food. And yet we here in Canada, we spend like $20 a meal, you know? and when you think about the food, like when we eat, are we just eating? Because a lot of the reasons why we get cancer, we get disease, so we eat too much. We should actually be fasting, like three days of fasting, it kills the zombie cells in our body so that cancer doesn't develop. So yeah, sometimes we have all this abundance and that's why the Bible says Laodicea, they're naked, they're poor, they're wretched, they think they're rich, but at the very end, they're miserable and poor. So, you know, there's, yeah, you know, it's, I'm so happy it's the Sabbath that we can come together, we can think about spiritual things, and we can think about eternal things. Because this life here, it's, it's so temporary. We graduate, we have kids, you know, like, I was thinking, what's the happiest day of my life? Was it getting my license? Was it graduating? Was it getting out of prison, you know, eight months. But uh, I think the greatest day will, is when we meet Christ, when we get to see him. Because in heaven, what's, what's the greatest desire you have in heaven? Do you have any greatest desires? To be with Jesus? Yeah. At first, when I was younger, I was like, oh, paradise in heaven, you know, beaches, coconuts, and, and uh, lions. But after I read Desire of Ages, and after I read, you know, different testimonies of different people, it's like, oh, heaven's going to be a place where there's just beautiful people, people with pure souls, beautiful souls, and beautiful characters. So, yeah, I just pray that we can all develop those characters, because the Bible says, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. And so the Sabbath day, it's, it's a challenge to, you know, not check our Facebook, to check our emails, you know. But, you know, Isaiah 58 says there's a blessing. And if we commit our, if we behold Christ and his life, if we put God first, God will bless us all. So I pray for each one of us, you know, we, we live in the city. I know there's a lot of influences that influence us here, but, you know, this is where all the people are. These are all, the, like, when I look at all the nurses in the hospitals and, 
it's oh, it's such a busy place, the city. Every time I drive around, oh, it's just too much congestion. But you know, the Lord has brought us here. We feel like we're we're right in like in Babylon, you know. But but Jesus says, you know, the gates of hell will not prevail. And so like we're we're right in that area where it's a struggle because, you know, they push all these drugs and all these things. And for us, we're like, how much do we stand up? You know, like, what, what do we say? Let it be. Or, you know, enough is enough. Because right now, one of our dilemmas that we have is his feeds. Our son, he, he, he regurgitates a lot. He vomits a lot. And uh, he's getting fed through his nose. And they're thinking about giving him a G-tube. So... At first, one of the doctors said, you know, you can try giving more milk at nighttime because he's more relaxed and then the milk gets digested. And then I said, okay, let's try that. But now they're giving a huge amount at nighttime and very little amount in daytime. And, and it, it hurts because like, you know, after reading what Ellen White writes about eating and digestion, we should be eating, you know, two or three meals a day. We shouldn't eat three, four hours before sleeping, right? Because when we sleep, our metabolism slows down, the food ferments, and the next day the food is still in our stomach because it didn't digest properly. And so it's a struggle. Like, of course it's milk, it's liquid, but for that so much milk at nighttime, you know, every three hours, he gets like 150 milliliters of milk. And in the daytime, 75 milliliters. It's it's like, Lord, give us wisdom. What should we do, you know? And so we're still learning. I, I thank God for the community, you know, and we have friends that are dietitians and other medical missionaries who can ask advice. And um, yeah, I just, I just pray the Lord will, will bless us all. You know, we all have different stories to share. We all have different struggles. That's why as we share our testimonies, it's, it's, it's a blessing to be just encouraged and you know, the struggles we go through, we, we sympathize for others. But um, at the end of the day, yeah, it's all glory to God. All these trials are, are to purge us and to purify us for his glory. So may, may the Lord bless us all as we continue to worship him in the Sabbath day. Is there any questions? Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. And this time, let's sing I Must Tell Jesus 485 before we close this with a prayer. Let's all rise. Yeah, let's all rise, please.
At this time, we'd like to invite everyone to come forward, and especially the Lim family, and if we can just surround them. And we'll ask uh, two prayers, probably um, uh, Pastor Lyomar and uh, Brother Amado. Are you okay? Pray for them, for their family. Yeah, let's, let's all surround them. And, uh, you know, they have been through a lot and are still, they're not, uh, we want to really lift up uh, baby Theo up to the Lord. Okay. Dear Father in heaven, we are here kneeling down to you, Lord, in front of you, uh, just as as we are, Lord. We cannot hide nothing in front of you, Lord, and you know each one of us. And uh, uh, we kneel down with the Lynn family, Lord. We see them from time to time here. And uh, uh, Lord, but probably now we have a, a better picture of, of uh, uh, how positive they are, Lord, but how challenging their life is mm -hmm. and uh, Lord uh, 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 what is probably, yeah, we, we have been ignoring many of those things Lord and uh, uh, but thank you for giving us uh, the positive way that they, they, they see life Lord uh, even though many of us probably we, we haven't been close to, to that kind of spiritual journey that they are having and they are still going through Lord and uh, so please keep them healthy on this uh, children Lord of yours we see them from time to time as well they are growing up and we have the opportunity to see them Lord as uh, they are growing up and uh, uh, yeah keep them physically well Lord uh, same for mommy and daddy because they need they need to be like that especially for our little brother Theo there Lord that is at the hospital and uh, Lord, uh, why, yeah, we may ask why this little life uh, without much suffering, Lord, but we know in part the, in part the answer, Lord, that there is a, an enemy that he, he tried to, to, to put any struggle or so, Lord, so we can see the impossibilities, Lord. But we as Christians, with hope in our hearts, we see the possibilities that exist in Jesus, Lord, and they are real for each one of us. So at uh, this moment, yeah, I pray for the family, Lord, but I pray for this little boy. Lord, uh, we know that he, with your help, of course, he's going to come out of the, the struggle situation, physical situation that he is, Lord, and he will be a living testimony for your honor and your glory very soon, Lord. So and uh, when he, he is still developed, he's still a little boy, Lord, uh, but nonetheless, uh, yeah. Keep him strong, and uh, every, he he is a very uh, tough soul that, that you are creating in him, Lord. And uh, yeah, keep keep him well, Lord. And uh, uh, as he 
every battle that he wins it will be for, is for your honor and your glory, Lord. Yeah. And Father, at this opportunity as well, I pray for the medical personnel, Lord. Yeah. So the nurses, the doctors, the specialists, uh, all of them yeah. is a yeah. team, totally, Lord. And uh, yeah, without them, uh, probably baby Theo will be in another situation, Lord. But yeah, bless them, Lord, and continue blessing. Uh, the personnel at the hospital and even the personnel at Ronald McDonald House, Lord, that they are housing our bread and Lord there. So, uh, yeah, uh, bless these uh, uh, societies, Lord, that they are here, uh, here to help. And Lord, uh, yeah, uh, this is an opportunity for the new family, like they are saying us, Lord. They are using every moment to, to continue spreading your word, your gospel, your good news to all other families, especially in that situation, Lord, the many families, they have lost hope. Yeah. And uh, they probably, they are blaming you, Lord, mm -hmm. for the things that are happening to their children. Uh, this is a good opportunity for my brethren, Lord, to, to say that that is not, that there is better hope that in Jesus, everything is in him, Lord, with, because without him we are nothing. So <coughs> continue blessing my brethren. Bless these children, Lord, they are all yours. Keep her strong, physically and spiritually, Lord, and uh, but especially for baby T, be with him. And, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, may all your blessings, the children, for them is the kingdom that you have prepared, Lord, so uh, be with him. And, uh, and bless us all tonight. Thank you for being with us tonight. In the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord. Our Father who art in heaven, the story of Theo is not new to us. You are using him to let these people in the community and in the hospital know that you are God. We have seen the pattern, Heavenly Father just like what happened to Joseph, just like what happened to Daniel, what happened to Job, what happened to the apostles, what happened to John the Baptist. They've been in that situation because you have a purpose for them. And now you have given us wisdom to understand all these things. Yes, Theo is in the hospital, but, but you have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And we want to know and to gain wisdom and to understand what is that purpose. And that is to let this family spread the good news to other people there in the hospital, mm -hmm. there in Ronald McDonald House. Mm -hmm. That they may see and know that you are in control. Now we have understood, we have wisdom that since the beginning of Theo's birth, we've been using him to spread the good news. Yes, it is good to live in the countryside, but there are lots of people here in the city. And we do believe, Heavenly Father, that this is one of the ways that you can use. Bless the family of Brother David and his wife. Give them the strength and the wisdom every time they converse and talk with other people. Let the message of Christ be heard in their words so that your name be glorified. We'll just commit to you into your hands, Heavenly Father. You are the God full of wisdom and understanding. You can you are the only one who can set time for him to live out of that hospital. It is also you who can decide to stay him in the hospital. Just for your glory. But for us, your children, our desire and our prayer is for him to be healed in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So that someday we have a chance to see him 
telling the good news, the things that you have done for him. That is the testimony that people want to hear as well. You bring back the glory to your name, Heavenly Father, for all of these things, because you are sovereign God. Help us to trust you in every way and in every circumstance of our life, just like this. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for teaching us this lesson. We bring back the glory to your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'd like to thank everyone and uh, regards from Pastor Matt. <laughs>